Uh, and a, another announcement before we start is that the uh, BYU Women in Chemistry Club is sponsoring a uh, resume help session uh, geared towards uh, STEM related resumes. Uh, that's going to be on Zoom. Uh, so if you want to participate, just take a picture and, and use that code uh, to register. Uh, I think this is open and I don't see anything indicating this is only for female students, but it is sponsored by the Women in Chemistry uh, Club. So I think anyone, anyone is welcome to participate. So where we left off with Chapter 9 on uh, Monday was showing you this reaction, this uh, acid-promoted dehydration reaction where the expected product... Uh, was a very, very minor product. The major product and the more abundant minor product were generated from a rearrangement of the carbon skeleton. Okay? Uh, and so what we learned from this reaction uh, was that uh, carbocations are able to rearrange to give more stable carbocations by shifting a group from one of the beta carbons or one of the adjacent carbons to the positively charged uh, carbon. So let's draw a mechanism for this process and see how this happens. So the first step is going to be the same as a, any other dehydration. We're going to protonate the oxygen using our uh, sulfuric acid. And that gives us our oxonium ion. Okay. Uh, and then our second step is going to be loss of water. We know that's going to be a slow step uh, because we're forming a uh, carbocation uh, in this process. Okay. Okay. So here's our carbocation uh, that we form initially. Uh, and what we've learned uh, up until now is that we would deprotonate a beta hydrogen uh, to make an alkene using the conjugate base of our acid. Uh, and remember, we use sulfuric acid or toluene sulfonic acid because those are um, non-nucleophilic. They're resonance stabilized, so they're not nucleophiles, uh, but they're a strong enough base. So that's what we would have expected to happen based on what we learned previously. And I'm just going to show that with uh, dashed arrows. Uh, and that's usually a fast reaction. Okay, and that would give us this particular alkene. Uh, but in this case, something even faster occurs in preference. That, that happens to a small degree, as uh, evidenced by the fact we get 3% of that product. Uh, but something even faster happens, which is one of the three methyl groups from this beta carbon shifts over here changing the carbon skeleton of the molecule. Okay. So now we have gone from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation uh, by migrating or shifting one of the methyl groups, one of the three methyl groups on this quaternary carbon. Okay. And that has to be faster than this. Um, in general, if you can rearrange a carbocation to a more stable carbocation by shifting one of the groups uh, on an adjacent carbon, uh, that rearrangement or shift will be faster than anything else that can happen to that carbocation. Okay? The reason for that is that it is a unimolecular process it only requires one molecule. It does not require a collision to take place in solution to occur. Uh, whereas for this 
process, this elimination process to occur, we have to have our base collide with our carbocation. Okay, so the unimolecular process is faster than the bimolecular process. Uh, so if a carbocation rearrangement can happen, it will happen. And the major product will always come from that rearrangement. But it will only happen to generate more stable carbocations. Okay? So the most common place we'll see it uh, is in a case like this, where we have a secondary carbocation that we have formed, uh, and a 1-2 shift can then give us a tertiary carbocation. Other instances we might see could be uh, a tertiary carbocation to give a resonant stabilized tertiary carbocation, or perhaps a strained tertiary carbocation rearranging to give a less strained tertiary carbocation. So there are other types, uh, and if you do the homework problems, you'll be exposed to some of those less common types. The most common example would be a secondary carbocation rearranging to give a tertiary carbocation. So once we get here, now we have uh, two different types of beta hydrogens in this molecule. So we take our base, uh, and we know that from Zaitsev's rule, uh, the more substituted alkene is going to be the major product. So if we remove this beta hydrogen, we're going to form a tetra-substituted alkene. Okay, looking like this. Uh, but we will get some of the less substituted. I'll draw that pathway using dashed arrows. Okay. So we will also get some of this product. Tetra-substituted alkene is our major product. 1,1-di-substituted alkene is our minor product. Uh, and then the one over here that we formed we'll call the really minor product, or the very minor product, I guess. Um, three products formed from this reaction. Two of them generated from a 1-2 shift or a rearrangement. Uh, and then the major of those is the tetra-substituted alkene. Okay. Uh, any questions about our rearrangement process? Yes, Morgan. Great question. Yes, any time... We, have, we haven't mentioned it yet in class, but uh, any time you form a carbocation intermediate, you have the possibility of a rearrangement. So, so indeed, any of our E1 or SN1 reactions involving alkyl halides, the examples we chose for you were, were, were specially chosen so they wouldn't involve rearrangements. Uh, but, but indeed, if you had uh, an alkyl halide that formed a carbocation uh, capable of rearranging, that would happen. Okay. So now that's something we need to be on the lookout. Every time we form a carbocation, we need to look at the beta carbons, the carbons attached to the positively charged carbon, and see if we can shift a group from one of those carbons to make a more stable carbocation. So we have a, an energy diagram here that's showing us the uh, rearrangement, the one I've drawn for you on the board. And a couple things we see from this energy diagram. Uh, the uh, methyl group is migrating with both of the electrons in the sigma bond. That's why we draw the arrow from the sigma bond. The two electrons in that sigma bond are migrating. Uh, and so, and then we see that they, at the transition state, those electrons, this sigma bond is gonna be uh, overlapping with the adjacent P orbital. Uh, as that shift is taking place, so the methyl group is going to be partially bonded to two carbons at the transition state. So we could draw, we could draw that here. Actually, let me draw this down like that. So this is what our transition state would look like for this migration, uh, partial sigma bonds between the methyl group uh, and these two adjacent carbons, partial positive charges. Uh, this partial positive charge is decreasing at the transition state. 
or sorry, this partial positive charge is decreasing, this partial positive charge is increasing at the transition state. Another thing we notice when we look at this uh, transition state is we have hybridization and geometry changing at each of our carbons that are participating. So the, the carbon from which the uh, methyl group is migrating, that's changing from sp3 to sp2, so that carbon is flattening out. It's somewhere between tetrahedral and planar at the transition state. Uh, this carbon is changing from sp2 to sp3, so that carbon is becoming pyramidalized, becoming more like a tetrahedron uh, at the transition state. Okay? So, but they're both somewhere in between sp2 and sp3 at the transition state. And then finally, the other thing we notice from this uh, diagram is that carbocation rearrangements are always exothermic. They're only going to happen if we go from a less stable carbocation to a more stable carbocation. So the ones that occur will always be exothermic. We would never see an endothermic carbocation rearrangement. Okay? Any questions? So the example we've shown you is an alkyl shift, or more specifically, a methyl shift. We have a methyl group migrating. It's common to have methyl groups or other alkyl groups participate in these migrations or, or rearrangements, uh, but it doesn't have to be an alkyl group. Uh, we could also have a hydrogen undergo a shift as part of a rearrangement, and that's referred to as a 1,2 hydride shift. Question? Um, not necessarily. It's just whichever one would give you the more stable carbocation will occur. Okay? Uh, and as I draw the hydride shift, you'll see that when you have a choice, usually the hydride shift is the one that can occur. But in many cases, you don't, you don't have a choice. If you look at the example we did here, all of the groups on the carbon where the migration occurred from were alkyl groups. And so it was, it was a, uh, an alkyl shift. So let's draw a different alcohol. I barely gave myself enough room to draw it. Uh, so let's react this secondary alcohol with sulfuric acid. We're going to protonate. Now we're going to lose water. Whoops, I uh, didn't draw that properly. Okay, we lose water from this oxonium ion. Okay. So now we've formed a secondary carbocation. So we have to ask ourselves, we have to look at the adjacent carbons, the beta carbons, and ask ourselves, is there a group that if we shift it over one carbon will allow us to form a more stable carbocation? In this case, if we shift this hydrogen, uh, that would give us a tertiary carbocation. Uh, so that will indeed be a uh, favorable process and a process that will happen faster than anything else uh, that could happen to that particular carbocation. So by moving the hydrogen atom over one carbon, we now have a tertiary carbocation. Okay. And so now that we've made it to this tertiary carbocation, we look at the beta hydrogens we'll see that we have two different types of beta hydrogens. Okay, so we could deprotonate this beta hydrogen. We could deprotonate this beta hydrogen. So that would give us Two different alkenes.
Would we predict there to be a major product in this case? Okay, shaking your head no, why not? Okay, they're both tri-substituted alkenes, so we wouldn't have a way of predicting. One may be a slightly more stable than another, but we wouldn't have learned, we haven't learned any ways to predict. Uh, and so we would just assume in here that uh, you would generate these in a one-to-one -one mixture. And there, there wouldn't be a major product. Question? Now, would it be possible for the carbon still to be the one in this scenario? So you're talking about having the ring migrate? You can have rings uh, undergo uh, migrations or ring expansions. So, so alkyl groups that are part of a ring can participate in a uh, rearrangement. Um, usually that happens when you have a smaller ring that is relieving ring strain in the process, going from three to four or four to five. That's where you typically see it. Uh, in the homework, I believe there's at least one example of something like that. So if you do the homework problems, you'll see uh, an example of that. Uh, we wouldn't see it in this particular case, though, uh, because there's no strain in our six-membered ring, uh, and we would only go from a secondary to a secondary if we tried to do that. So in this case, migrating the hydrogen to go from a secondary to a tertiary is better than that. Okay? So usually you'll be able to figure out which group would undergo the migration because there will be a clear winner in terms of which uh, possible carbocation would be the most stable. So in terms of the products, we get um, no difference, uh, no real difference in the energy. Uh, you'll notice that the one on the left could also be formed directly, sorry, directly from our carbocation. You can get this product either from the original carbocation or the rearranged carbocation. Uh, but the fact that this one comes along with it is evidence that the rearrangement does, in fact, occur. Okay? We get both of these products from this reaction telling us that this rearrangement does happen. Question? That's a good question. Uh, I don't have data for this particular reaction, but based on the data over here, where the, uh, the, the alkene from the non-rearranged carbocation was really, really small, I don't think it would be a significant difference. I think that we would expect uh, these to be uh, formed in comparable amounts. Okay, good questions. Other, other questions? Okay, so um, part, uh, the, the fact that these rearrangements can happen uh, is uh, a, a problem and a drawback because many times we want to perform a, a dehydration without a rearrangement occurring. So if we wanted to make the alkene over here on the left, if that was the product we desired, uh, then we're out of luck if this is the only way to perform a dehydration. Uh, but fortunately, it's not. Uh, organic chemists have devised another way of performing dehydrations of alcohols that does not involve carbocation intermediates and therefore does not involve rearrangements. Okay, uh, and that uses a reagent called phosphorus oxychloride, or POCl3. Uh, and then that's used in conjunction with pyridine. This is pyridine. Pyridine is a weak base. It can also be used as the solvent and frequently is used as the solvent in these reactions. Uh, the book doesn't mention that we use two equivalents of pyridine in this reaction. Uh, it's often, as I mentioned, used as the solvent, so it's kind of understood it's in excess. But when we draw the mechanism, you'll see that we're using two equivalents of the pyridine uh, in this particular uh, dehydration. So we're going to generate an alkene in this process, the same as we would uh, if we were to use uh, sulfuric acid or toluene sulfonic acid. but the mechanism is going to be different. It's not going to involve carbocation intermediates. So let's go ahead and draw that mechanism. So phosphorus oxychloride looks like this. 
It has five bonds to the phosphorus. That's fine because phosphorus is a third row element. It's allowed to exceed the octet. Uh, the key feature of this molecule is the fact that the phosphorus has five bonds to more, and they're all to more electronegative atoms. So you've got a pretty big partial positive charge on that phosphorus because of those five bonds that are all polarized away from the phosphorus. So this is highly electrophilic on the phosphorus atom. Electrophilic enough that a weak nucleophile, such as an alcohol, is able to attack that phosphorus in an SN2 type of process. Okay, That's going to displace chloride as a leaving group. And then that's going to give us, I'm not going to draw out the uh, POCl2 species, but it has a double bond to the oxygen and single bonds to the chlorines, just like I drew it over here. Okay, uh, And we have an oxonium ion, positively charged oxygen. So now our pyridine, our first equivalent of pyridine, is going to make an appearance. This is a weak base, but strong enough to deprotonate the positively charged oxygen. That's going to give us a pyridinium ion as a byproduct. Okay, this cation, that's just forming a salt with the chloride that was generated uh, in the previous step. Okay. All right, so now what we have is something that is an outstanding leaving group. When this leaves, that the negative charge on the oxygen can be delocalized onto the other oxygen. And then we also have these two chlorines that can inductively stabilize a negative charge. Uh, so uh, we have a very, very good leaving group, an excellent leaving group, a better leaving group than even a halide. So what that allows us to do is use our second equivalent of weak base, pyridine in this case, in an E2 reaction. Right? We have, we, we, the first time we saw a weak base in an E2 reaction was on Monday. It's, it's less common. Uh, but here, because we have such an outstanding leaving group, this works. Our pyridine comes in, deprotonates a beta hydrogen, we lose our leaving group, and that gives us our alkene. That gives us, I'll go ahead and draw it out here. Our leaving group, resonance stabilized leaving group, induction, uh, and then right here at the bottom, I'll draw our pyridinium cation that forms a salt with this leaving group. Question? Okay, good. All right, so this is an E2, the elimination step. This last step here uh, is an E2 process. Uh, so there's no carbocation that is formed, and therefore there is no rearrangement. Okay, and key features to understand the mechanism, recognizing the high electrophilicity of that phosphorus, as well as the excellent leaving group ability of this species. Questions? Yes. Pyridinium, is that what we're talking about? Yep. That's because we form it twice. Yeah, we're, we're using two equivalents of pyridine, so we're forming pyridinium twice. Yes. Exactly. You can just leave it off to the side like this uh, and not worry about it anymore. That's, that's fine. Uh, yeah, the only reason we've got this one here is because it's formed in the final step as well. Good questions. 
So you'll notice in this dehydration, we're not actually forming water. Uh, we're losing the elements of water from our starting alcohol, so that's why it's called a dehydration. Uh, but you see that the oxygen ends up going with the phosphorus, uh, and the two hydrogens that we're losing each end up going with uh, the pyridine. Okay? So we're not actually forming water, uh, but we would still call this a dehydration because we're losing the elements of water from our starting alcohol. So the book gives us, yeah, question, Morgan. Wouldn't it be a better leaving group if it had the, 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 the proton there? Uh, it would, uh, but because you're usually using the pyridine in excess, you, you're usually using it as a solvent. Uh, you have a high enough concentration of pyridine in there uh, that the pyridine, as it looks at this molecule, it's going to remove the most acidic hydrogen first. So it's going to remove this hydrogen before it removes that hydrogen. Okay, and there's a, there's... There's a high concentration of that in there, uh, and so that uh, allows us to use it twice uh, in this particular case. Okay, good question. Yes, Claire. That's a good question. So toluene sulfonic acid will always be used in eliminations because the conjugate base is not a nucleophile. It's that resonance stabilized base that won't be a nucleophile. Uh, we'll learn at the end of class today a substitution reaction involving a similar reagent, a, a related reagent called thionochloride, SOCl2. Uh, there is some crossover. You can see POCl3 in substitutions. Uh, you can also see SOCl2, which we'll learn at the end of class in uh, eliminations. Uh, but it's more common for them to be used in the way we're teaching them in class. So if you just want to uh, learn it the way we're teaching it in class, where every time we see POCl3, it'll be an elimination, a dehydration. Every time we see SOCl2, it'll be a substitution. So in the real world, it's not quite that simple, uh, but we're willing to, to kind of simplify things to make it a little easier uh, for you to learn. Okay. So a couple examples the book shows us. Uh, this tertiary alcohol was dehydrated uh, uh, to generate a precursor to vitamin A. Uh, here, they, were form they formed a tertiary carbocation. They actually formed a resonance stabilized tertiary carbocation, so there was no fear of rearrangement. So the uh, toluene sulfonic acid worked great for that reaction. Uh, and then down here, uh, they used the POCl3 and pyridine. This is a fairly complex molecule, uh, even though it's a tertiary uh, would be a tertiary carbocation. It's relatively strained, and so there might be the possibilities of rearrangement. Phosphorus, oxychloride, and pyridine gave the desired product, which could be converted into this particular natural product. All right, so um, we've said that toluene sulfonic acid and sulfuric acid, when they react with alcohols, will cause dehydration to occur. And we've said that you have to use those acids. So what would happen if you reacted an alcohol with one of our HX acids instead? What if we used HBr or HI or HCl? What would happen instead of dehydration? Any ideas? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we would see a substitution process because with HX, our conjugate bases are strong nucleophiles. And so those, those conjugate bases of those HX acids will want to function as a nucleophile. Uh, and so we would see a substitution process instead of an elimination process. Okay, so this, this particular reaction... Uh, with one propanol and HBr would give us one bromopropane, uh, and we would have water as a byproduct. So we'll draw the mechanism in a minute. You described it very nicely with your answer question. Um, 
because they're negatively charged. Uh, most negatively charged species are strong nucleophiles. Right? In chapter 7, we just said all negatively charged species are strong nucleophiles. Now we're learning a few that aren't, uh, but usually they're highly resonance stabilized. So unless it's highly resonance stabilized, if it has a negative charge, uh, or unless it's really bulky, those are the two things that could prevent something from, that's negatively charged from being a good nucleophile. So if it's not highly resonance stabilized, not bulky, then it's going to be a strong nucleophile if it's negatively charged. So uh, a little bit of data, uh, relative rates. Primary alcohols will react slower than secondary alcohols which in turn reacts slower than tertiary alcohol. So this is comparable to the dehydration, where the more substituted alcohols react faster. So let's go ahead and draw a mechanism. And similar to the dehydration, the acid-promoted dehydration, the mechanism depends on the type of alkyl halide that we have. If it's a secondary or tertiary alkyl halide, or sorry, alcohol, not alkyl halide, we're making alkyl halides, a secondary or tertiary alcohol will react via an SN1 mechanism with a carbocation intermediate. Okay? So our first step should be familiar. We're going to protonate the OH. To make a good leaving group, we've lost chloride in the process. Once we have our good leaving group, the water departs. That's going to be a slow step. Gosh, the chalk is breaking all over the place today. So that gives us a tertiary carbocation in this case. Okay. Now, when we use sulfuric acid or toluene sulfonic acid, we would deprotonate the carbocation that formed uh, because those species were non-nucleophilic due to the resonance stabilization of that negative charge. But here, with our HX acids, the conjugate base is a strong nucleophile. So because it is a weak base and a strong nucleophile, uh, it reacts faster as a nucleophile than as a base. So when it encounters a carbocation, it's going to attack that carbocation and it's going to give us the alkyl halide product, okay? So that's what happens when we have a secondary or tertiary alcohol. We have an energy diagram for this reaction over here. Uh, and it shows us uh, three transition states. So that tells us that there are three steps uh, to the reaction. You can see that uh, indeed the carbocation formation is our rate determining step. Okay. Uh, the other two steps are both quite fast. Protonation of the alcohol uh, and attack of the chloride on the carbocation. Uh, both very rapid steps. Okay. But if we are using a primary alcohol, such as ethanol, we have to have a different mechanism because we're not going to form a primary carbocation from a primary alcohol. So we would protonate. Okay, getting our oxonium ion, uh, but instead of losing a carbocation, in this case, we have an SN2 process that ensues, giving us the alkyl halide, bromoethane in this case, and water as a leaving group, okay? So you'll notice that 
we, we said that the more substituted alcohols react faster. And what that means is that the SN1 process is happening faster than the SN2 process. This is the only time, to my knowledge, that we encounter something like this in organic chemistry, where the SN1 reaction is faster than the SN2. Uh, and honestly, it's difficult to understand and difficult to explain why. Okay, I don't have a, a real great explanation as for why uh, it happens faster uh, with the more substituted alcohols. The best that I can do is to note that the leaving group in this case is water, which is a good leaving group, but it is the worst of our good leaving groups. All the other good leaving groups we've learned are better leaving groups than water. The halides are better than water. Uh, we'll learn other leaving groups. This, this leaving group uh, that we erased in the POCl3 reaction, that's much better than water. Uh, so because it's the worst of our good leaving groups, the rate of the SN2 reaction is affected more than the rate of the SN1 reaction, okay? And I'm not sure why that is, but it's clear because this reaction pathway is faster than this one. And we have data uh, that will support that that I'll show you in a moment, okay? Question? Why does it proceed if we're if we're producing a better leaving group? Yes. Right. So what's the byproduct that we're forming? Is that a strong nucleophile? It is not. So we're we're removing. We had a strong nucleophile. We have our halide ion, but now we no longer have a strong nucleophile. So this is not going to be able to come in and displace our uh, our halide. Okay. So that's that's a great question. And that's the reason for, you know, that, it, that it goes in the way that it does. So uh, another feature of this reaction is that it's faster with stronger acids. So HF is going to be unreactive. Uh, HCl is going to react the slowest of our acids that react. Uh, and then HI is going to be the fastest. And if you look in both mechanisms, these species are participating as acids prior to the rate determining step. So anything that happens prior to the rate determining step can impact the rate determining step. So, uh, so the stronger acids will allow these uh, steps before the rate determining step to be faster. Question. This is not a dehydration. Uh, this is just a substitution. A dehydration only refers to elimination. Even though we're losing water here, it's not a dehydration because a dehydration is a type of elimination. And these are substitution reactions. Yes. Yes. Weaker base, weaker nucleophile. It would depend on your solvent. You're using an alcohol uh, typically as the solvent and the reactant. And so because it's polar uh, protic, it would be a stronger nucleophile. But they're all good. They're all strong nucleophiles. Yeah, because they're functioning as acids prior to the rate determining step. That's the easiest way, the easiest way to, to look at it. So one consequence of this is that when we combine our slowest reacting alcohol, a primary alcohol, with our slowest reacting acid, HCl, the reaction does not proceed on its own. We actually have to add a Lewis acid and zinc chloride is a commonly added Lewis acid in order to get the substitution of a primary alcohol and HCl to occur. So what we generate is this species here, which is called a Lewis acid, Lewis base complex, where we, we have a positively charged oxygen, very similar to what we have when we protonate, uh, but this is actually an even better leaving group uh, than what would happen uh, if we lost water. And so once we form this, uh, then our halide chloride can come in in the SN2 fashion. And we're going to generate chloroethane. 
And then we're going to get this uh, zinc species uh, as our leaving group, okay? So the slowest reacting alcohol, the slowest reacting acid, they're going to need uh, a Lewis acid in order to react, okay? Let's talk about stereochemistry of these substitution reactions. When we react a primary alcohol with an alkyl halide, would we expect inversion of stereochemistry or racemization of stereochemistry? I'll draw you a special chiral primary alcohol. If you replace one of the hydrogens of ethanol with a deuterium, now we have a chiral primary alcohol. So we can test this in the lab, and it's been done. So if we were to take this chiral primary alcohol and react it with HX, would we expect inversion or racemization? Inversion, it's an SN2 process, so it's going to proceed by inversion. Okay. And as I mentioned, that this has been verified. It works. Okay. Uh, what about a secondary or tertiary alcohol? We would get racemization in that case because we have a carbocation intermediate. Uh, and in fact, the different stereochemical outcomes of these reactions provide evidence for the mechanisms. The fact that we do see racemization with secondary and tertiary alcohols tells us that those are SN1 processes, whereas the reaction with the primary alcohol affords clean inversion, therefore it is an SN2 reaction. Okay. So tertiary alcohols such as this one and secondary alcohols as well uh, give inver or give uh, racemization. Okay. Any questions about substitutions of alcohols with HX? Okay, so the fact that we get, uh, we have carbocations, which will uh, give racemization, which is undesirable. Uh, they can undergo rearrangements, which is also undesirable, uh, has led to uh, the dis discovery of alternative reagents uh, that can convert alcohols into alkyl halides without having carbocation intermediates. Uh, and in the last couple minutes, we'll just show you uh, the reagent that is used to form chlorides from alcohols. And that reagent is called thionyl chloride, or SOCl2. Okay. So we react an alcohol with SOCl2. We use pyridine again as a base. And we're going to generate an alkyl halide an alkyl chloride in this case. Okay, let's use ethanol as our example for drawing the mechanism. So thionyl chloride is going to be similar to phosphorus oxychloride uh, in that it has a third row element, a sulfur atom, with four bonds each to more electronegative atoms. So that sulfur is highly electrophilic. So we're gonna have the same first step that we had in the POCl3 dehydration. And that's going to give us this oxonium ion, okay? And then we're going to have the same second step. We're going to have the pyridine deprotonate that oxygen. All right, so now when we get to this point, instead of having an elimination, uh, what happens is we have a substitution where our chloride 
anion that we produced in our first step is going to come and function as a nucleophile. Okay. This is an excellent leaving group. It can fragment. So here's our product that we want. Here's our chloride, our chloroethane product. But when we look at the byproducts, this leaving group undergoes a fragmentation and you generate sulfur dioxide, which is a gas. So you're releasing a gas, a very, very stable uh, gas. And so that's uh, thermodynamically beneficial. Uh, and when we do that, we're also spitting out a chloride, another chloride, which is a very good leaving group. Uh, so uh, this, this is entropically favorable. We're taking two species and we're forming three products. We're releasing an anion that's a very good leaving group. Uh, and we're using the chloride that was produced in our first step uh, as a nucleophile in this case to make our chloride. Question. Well, it, we, we know it because when, when people run the reaction, you can detect this. This smells really bad. So, uh, so it's very obvious uh, when SO2 is produced. Uh, and so because you know that's what's going to happen, you know, uh, and you would have an idea that it would happen because you know that this is a very stable molecule. And so it's very likely uh, to happen as well. So uh, we didn't use a chiral uh, alcohol in this case, but as far as stereochemistry goes, what, what do you think would happen in this particular substitution? Would it be uh, inversion or would it be racemization? It would be inversion. This is an SN2 process, so it would proceed by inversion. Uh, and so because of that, because it's an SN2 process, this only works with primary and secondary alcohols. You wouldn't see this with tertiary alcohols. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, we'll stop there and we'll talk some more about other substitutions of alcohols and continue on with chapter nine on Friday.